Dzień dobry, witam Was serdecznie. Nazywam się Filip Makowiecki i będę moderatorem dzisiejszego webinarium. Webinarium pod tytułem Whole School Approach to Prevention of Hate Speech, które poprowadzi Pan Zakija. I tu nie pamiętam nazwiska, mam nadzieję, że Malina im pomoże. Dzień dobry. Czy mnie widać? Tak, widać Cię. Ja mam taką propozycję. Zakija z nami zaraz się połączy, w związku z czym teraz Malina opowie, bawi kilka słów na temat samego programu, natomiast chwilę później ja przedstawię podstawy obsługi technicznej platformy Click Webinar, a następnie, kiedy już będziemy mieli pewność, że wszystko działa i wszyscy mogą w pełni korzystać z webinarium, przekażemy głos naszej dzisiejszej prelegentce. Dobrze, także Malina oddaję teraz mikrofon Tobie. Dobrze. To ja się nazywam Malina i o, proszę. tu jestem um, i jestem koordynatorką projektu Nienawiść, jestem przeciw. Um, I dzisiejsze webinarium um, to jest pierwsze z dwóch takich webinariów eksperckich, które postanowiliśmy zrobić w naszym projekcie, um, żeby uczestnicy i uczestniczki no, mogli jeszcze pogłębić wiedzę na temat mowy nienawiści. Um, pierwsze webinarium, do którego zaprosiliśmy za Kije, to jest nasza ekspertka z Norwegii z Europejskiego Centrum Wergalanda, które jest naszym partnerem w projekcie i ona będzie mówić o takim całościowym podejściu do przeciwdziałania mowie nienawiści w szkołach. Ona ma bardzo duże doświadczenie, bo pracuje z szkołami z Norwegii i właśnie pracuje tylko ze szkołami, ale pracuje z rodzicami, z uczniami i z nauczycielami i tym będzie mogła się dzisiaj z nami podzielić. Mam nadzieję, że zaraz się pojawi i, i, i będziemy ją, ją słyszeć i widzieć, ponieważ no, Norwegia jest troszkę daleko od nas. Filip, czy ty jesteś tam? Jest tak, Filip. tak, cały czas jestem. Ja trochę oszczędzam, łączę zarówno uczestników, jak i prezenterów, ponieważ kilka kamer ten mikrofonów jednocześnie włączonych może je nieco nadwyrężać. Zakija jest już z nami, za chwilę również włączy kamerę oraz mikrofon. Ja natomiast teraz proszę jeszcze o dosłownie 2-3 minuty uwagi, ponieważ chciałbym pokazać takie główne funkcje Click Webinar, które dzisiaj ja będziemy wykorzystywać. Mhm, dobrze, wielkie dzięki. Dzięki. Ty mnie musisz odłączyć. No. Dobrze, już to robię. Dobrze. E, otóż e, obsługa webinarium jest e, naprawdę bardzo prosta. O, e, hello Zakia. E, we can't hear you, so... What about now? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. So uh, please uh, give me like uh, two minutes, so I will show the functions of uh, the webinar to our participants. To our participants. Okay. Should I uh, turn off the camera or just leave it? No, no, please uh, stay, stay on with us. Okay, okay. <laughs> Także podczas całego webinarium jest otwarty dla Państwa czat, który jest widoczny w okienku z napisem czat, jak można się było domyślić, które jest dwa okienka niżej niż obraz kamery. Zachęcam, żeby przez całe webinarium korzystać z tego do zadawania pytań, do dzielenia się tymi wątpliwościami oraz uwagami. Czat teraz nie jest moderowany, w związku z czym wszystko, co napiszecie, będzie się tam pojawiało, ponieważ nasza prelegentka jest był niepolskojęzyczną, byłoby dobrze pisać w języku angielskim. Na koniec webinarium planujemy również krótką sesję pytań i odpowiedzi. Nie ma nas zbyt dużo, bo są teraz dużo trzy osoby, jednak mam nadzieję, że uda się jakąś dyskusję nawiązać. Druga taka funkcja, na której wykorzystywaniu bardzo mi zależy, to funkcja szybkiej informacji zwrotnej. Otóż teraz włączę, albo lepiej nie będę włączał. Otóż w okienku lista uczestników, która jest okienkiem nad czatem, w lewym, w prawym dolnym rogu jest okienko osiągniętej puści. Jeżeli ją klikniecie, macie dostęp do takiej szybkiej informacji zwrotnej. Na przykład zgadzam się. Wtedy na liście uczestników, którą ja widzę, pojawia się wasza wypowiedź, taka milcząca wypowiedź. Gdybyście mieli jakiekolwiek problemy podczas webinarium z jego obsługą, proszę użyjcie ikony 
kobartynkowego, który będzie dla mnie sygnałem, że coś jest nie tak i że muszę z nim w prywatnym wam pomóc. Także teraz na znak tego, że wszystko jest w porządku, proszę kliknijcie zielony plusik. OK, wielkie dzięki. I również, żeby sprawdzić, czy działa czat, proszę napiszcie coś na czacie. To dla mnie zawsze będzie sygnał, że wszystko jest naprawdę w porządku. Okay. Cześć Agata, hello Kate. And hello Karolina. OK, thank you. That's all for now. So, uh, hello Zakia, we can start now the main part of our webinar. Main part of our webinar. Okay. Great. So should I just start, uh, Philip, or yeah? Uh, no, uh, you can just start. No, there all uh, in our conference room, so there's no need to click anything. Okay. Just let me know when I should start, and I will start. <laughs> okay, please start. Okay, please start. Okay. <laughs> Okay, hi everybody. I hope you can all hear me uh, without, and I hope this session will go through without any big technical difficulties, hopefully. Um, so I'm sure Melina and Philip uh, introduced me in Polish. I don't understand any Polish, so, but I'm gonna introduce myself very shortly. Uh, so my name is Zakia Aku. I work for the European Vergland Center, which is a center um, uh, situated in Oslo, but um, we were established by Norway and the Council of Europe to work in all 47 member states, including uh, Poland. So I work um, on this project, or we do, with um, with Melina and with the Center for Citizenship Education. Uh, so the, the topic for today's uh, webinar is um, a whole school approach on prevention of hate speech. So what I will do and what I will uh, try to spend the next hour doing with you, and hopefully please feel, feel free to ask questions to stop me at any time. Uh, this is what we're going to do um, during, the, um, during this webinar. Uh, first, I want to uh, talk a bit about how hate speech um, uh, constitutes a human rights violation and how hate speech relates to uh, basic human rights. Uh, then I will go on to talk about why school is so important and why uh, prevention of hate speech should be part of what schools are doing. Um, uh, then I will talk about, which is kind of the main thing of, of um, main theme of this webinar, is how uh, we can work in a whole school approach, how we can um, uh, involve all actors that need to be part of a whole school approach to prevention, uh, meaning empowerment of students, the role of teachers and school heads, and how to ensure, and this is always a difficult thing, but how to ensure parents' involvement. Uh, lastly, I will um, talk a bit about how this uh, translates into practice, so what works, and hopefully I will um, uh, show you some examples from Norway or just tell you briefly about some example from examples from Norway. Uh, where we work with schools on this um, subject. Um, so before we start, uh, I just want to, just so that we are on the same um, on the same page, I want to go through two definitions that I will probably use quite a lot in this webinar. Uh, first is um, the the term hate speech, which is the main topic of this webinar. Um, and my definition is the definition of the Council of Europe. Um, uh, and, and it says that hate speech covers all forms of expression which spread inside, promote, justify, or justify racial hatred, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, anti -Semitism, or other forms of hatred based on intolerance, including intolerance exp expressed by aggressive nationalism and ethnocentrism, discrimination and hostility against minorities, migrants, and people of immigrant uh, origin. Shortly, what this uh, definition says is that hate speech, and this is where hate speech can be divided from or can be separated from other forms of kind of the similar a phenomena is that hate speech is when we're talking about something that is uh, based on or hate or based on prejudice against a group. So it's this 
group focused enmity factor that separates hate speech in this definition from other forms of from other forms of um, of um, of bullying, etc. A uh, group focused enmity describes the syndrome of interlinked negative attitudes and prejudices towards groups identified as others, different or, or abnormal. So, in short, a group focused enmity is when you use a group, uh, signi something signifying a group as a way of excluding a group or um, having prejudice or stereotypes targeted one group. Uh, so this is basically uh, the definitions. Uh, if you have any questions, if I talk too fast, if there's anything, please do let me know and I will try to adjust so that you will all hear me and see me hopefully. Um, so it is also, I think, important to, when we speak about hate speech, to look at what ex to what extent is hate speech uh, a problem, a challenge in Europe? And to do that, I'm going to use a report. This is from 2011. Um, I, I will use the numbers from this report because it is a very comprehensive report. It is um, done in the eight major countries in Europe, in the uh, in the um, uh, in the European uh, Union, and it's France, Germany, Great Britain, Hungary, Italy, Netherlands, Poland, and Portugal. So. A pretty huge important uh, countries in in Europe. Um, the um, the research is done by the Frederick Albert Stiftung, Stiftung in which is a center research center in Germany, um, and it is uh, named Intolerance, Prejudice, and Discrimination: A European Report. What this report uh, says is that group focused enmity is widespread in Europe. Uh, there are some differences between countries. It says, according to this report, that, that group focused enmity, which is, you know, this group focused hate or group focused prejudice or stereotype, is um, most prevalent in Poland and Hungary and least prevalent in the Netherlands of these eight countries that I mentioned. What is said, but it's still prevalent in all uh, and widespread in all of, all of the countries. Um, about 50% of uh, of the Europeans in this report believe that there are too many immigrants in their country, um, uh, and many believe that many believe that Jews seek to benefit from their from the, the suffering of the in the Holocaust. This is a huge difference between countries, um, and this is what's interesting with this report as well. You see that for some of the, and I'm just summing up the main figures. For some of them, for some of the uh, results, there are huge difference between countries. For some of the results, there are uh, almost complete similarity between the countries. And this is very interesting because we see that when it comes to anti-Semitism, sexism, uh, homophobia, there are big differences between countries. Um, while when it comes to anti-immigrant sentiment or anti-Muslim hatred, this is the same in all of the in all of the countries. So France and Germany, who has you know France has ten percent of the Muslim population, Germany has seven percent uh, Muslim population, will have the same results of anti-Muslim hatred as Poland, uh, that only has. 0.07, so not even um, up one percent of of Muslim population. So this is very interesting, uh, I would say. Uh, with regards to anti-Semitism, according to this uh, to this um, report, the statement that the Jews seek to um, benefit from the Holocaust in the Netherlands is only 17 percent, which is high enough. But in the Poland, the same amount is 70. So a huge difference. Um, there is widespread um, uh, Islamophobia in Europe. 50% um, of all Europeans say Islam uh, is a is a religion of intolerance. As, and as I said, this is the same regardless of how many Muslims uh, live in the country, in the given country. Um, about 30% believe there is a natural hierarchy of ethnicities, which is kind of this uh, old classical racism. Um, 
uh, a majority in Europe also uh, subscribe to sexist attitudes um, rooted in traditional um, gender roles. Um, uh, a relatively high proportion are against equal rights for homosexuals as for uh, heterosexual couples. Um, in, and the, this is where we see also a huge difference between the countries. In Netherlands, again, which has the smallest amount, 17% uh, will say this, while in Poland, uh, which has the highest amount, will say 88% will say this is uh, true. Um, and what this report also finds is, is that prejudices are interconnected. So those who are against or have stereotypes or prejudice against one group are more likely to have one against another group, to have prejudice against another group. So one who, who subscribe to anti-Semitic attitudes will most likely also have anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim, anti- or homophobic, um, or homophobic attitudes. Uh, what this report also uh, finds is that group focus enmity increases with age and decreases with education. And this is why I also think that schools are so important in combating and preventing hate speech because education is, you know, according to research, what helps in, um, in the long term. In summary, uh, the report says that hate speech uh, represents a major threat to fundamental values of democracy and human rights in, in Europe. Uh, and this is and this is our starting point, I think, because very often when we speak about uh, prevention of hate speech and kind of when we target the negative sides of the internet, it's a, it's very easy to kind of become completely uh, negative towards internet and towards um, and towards um, social media. Our approach and the approach of the Council of Europe as well is the complete opposite. We see um, social media and the internet as an integral part of a modern democracy, uh, of modern democracies, and something that's important to preserve for the sake of democracy. And that's why also prevention of hate speech online is so important. Um, what hate speech does, I mean, firstly, it violates fundamental dignity of groups and people, and that's why it's a human rights challenge. Um, but also, and secondly, because um, what the reason why uh, social media is such an important part of our democracies today is that um, it has lowered the barriers of, participa of participation and um, and made it easier to to participate in everything from you know public discourse to uh, uh, political campaigns to social projects etc. This is a democratic good and it's important to preserve. Um, what hate speech can do is people can uh, decide not to participate in the public discourse, not to participate in you know democracy in a sense because they are afraid of they are either sick of all the hatred, sick of all um the violation against their own dignity and also because they can experience threats and are uh, afraid of continuing continuing participation um so it can in impede participation and this is of course a major human rights and a major challenge to our democracies uh, also and this is um because i think it's important to see uh, hate speech and human rights on different levels. So on the individual level, on group level, or on society level. So on the individual level, it can cause people to um, to not participate. It can also cause individuals, and we have seen examples on this all over Europe, of people who have been bullied online for so long uh, that they commit suicide. You know, it goes, it affects them psychologically and also physically. So this is on the individual level. On the group level, we see something that is well known in history, well known in in kind of um, a dy dynamic of the process of dehumanization, which is kind of a psychological process on on group level, which uh, demonize a, a group, making them seem less human and therefore not worthy of humane uh, treatment. This can lead, of course, and we have seen this in many cases, and we see it today as well. Um, this can lead to increased violence, uh, uh, violence, um, violation of human rights, 
uh, war crimes uh, genocide. I mean, uh, the dehumanization was necessary for the genocides in Europe during the Holocaust, for the genocides um, in Rwanda, Yugoslavia, and elsewhere. So it's very important part of um, these uh, awful um, acts towards humanity is that in order to do something so bad against human beings, you have to make them less human. You have to dehumanize them. And hate speech also works towards this. Um, we, uh, also, what we know is that hate speech does not always lead to hate crimes, but we know that hate, hate crimes are always preceded by hate speech. So prior to the awful attacks of the terrorist Breivik in Norway on, in Utøya, we know that he was active online spreading hate. And we see this as well with recruitment to um, the Islamic, the so-called Islamic State in, in Syria and Iraq is the use of hate speech to, de uh, to demonize the enemy, de demonize the West. And this is a way, a strategy of, of recruitment. So hate speech and hate crime always um, are interconnected in a sense. Um, and uh, so this is a bit about why this is important in a human rights perspective, in a perspective of democracy. Um, and I will go on now to speak a bit about the role of schools and why I think education is the most important, one of the most, if not the most important tool to combat and prevent hate speech. Um, we know in general that um, schools are the most important arenas of prevention. Uh, this is what, where we meet everyone. Uh, it's the only uh, arena uh, where all students of all backgrounds meet and, and in, in one room. Um, Non-formal education do not have the same access because often that is activities where people choose to participate or not, while schools are you know, at, at least, you know, um, uh, from first to 10th grade are most often it's obligatory um, for most groups, although we know that some groups are excluded uh, regardless of this. Um, and uh, more, more specifically, schools have the, I mean, the overall mandate of schools is to educate democratic citizens. Uh, so this goes in, it's not subject specific, but it goes into the overall mandate of schools, uh, which is to educate uh, democratic citizens and to promote democratic and democratic values and build democratic citizens. And this goes, of course, online as well as offline. Um, what is important is um, Young people will meet prejudice, will meet hate, will meet all these phenomena regardless. So what is important is that the classroom is becomes a safe space for discussions, for reflections, for challenging, for getting one's own views challenged, challenged and for challenging other people's views. And it, there needs to be kind of a safe space where children or youth can come together and disagree where there are rooms for disagreement and um, for being self reflect uh, reflective meaning you know i've had these views my whole life because i probably got them from my parents or from people throughout my upbringing but wait a minute i see that you have another view and maybe in the exchange of our views we can also uh, look we can also look um, critically at our own views and maybe also change them. So it is important that schools, because it's the only safe space we have, it's the only place we have where we can have this um, in a safe environment, in a sense. Uh, and I think today more important maybe than ever is the importance of critical thinking, because we have more information and we have access to more information than ever. And with this access to increased information, we say, good, it's a democratic good, and it's a good. Um, we, but we need critical thinking to, um, to separate the good from the bad, to separate the right from the wrong, to separate the historic facts from, uh, uh, from, the, um, from the, all the theories, the conspiracy theories, you know, this is important. And especially when we combat, you know, hate ideologies, radicalization, extremism, etc. Um, 
And also what is important in a school, uh, in a school context, and this is what I will uh, spend uh, most of the rest of this session talking about, is a whole school approach. It is important, it is of the utmost importance that, um, that students uh, hear the same uh, at school as they hear at home. So it doesn't help if only one teacher and in the classroom as in the school as a whole. So it doesn't help if you alone as a teacher, you're good and you spread all the, the right uh, values and you build good democratic citizens, but they need to see this in the whole school, meaning the school heads, the teachers, amongst their students, their parents, the local community. So it is important in order to build democratic citizens, I think it's very important to work in a whole, to have a whole school approach. Um, so, and this is uh, when we, uh, when we, just one second, yeah. So when we, um, when we work in a whole school approach, it is also in many ways a student-centered approach where students is the center of education. It's the main uh, main beneficiary of, of education, but also one of the main actors. Um, a, a student, a student-centered approach uh, means taking the students uh, seriously. Taking them seriously as actors in the classroom, they're not just there to listen to you, but they're there to contribute and to exchange, uh, be in an exchange with you as a teacher and with the rest of the class. Uh, but also taking them serious, and this is what's important when we come to combating online hate speech, is taking them seriously as active citizens online as well as offline um, and in many ways i mean this should be the least we can do because in many ways and i think many of you can agree with me that students are uh, you know the online world is a natural habitat in many ways the natural space the world of young people so often, more often than not, and I see this in my interactions with, uh, with students all the time, they will know more about social media than I do. And they will have more of kind of a feeling of what's wrong and what's right uh, in social media and in the online world that I do. So we have to take them seriously. And we have to also be open to not only teach uh, our students, but also be taught by them and to learn from them. And especially in a field where they, you know, after all, have a lot of knowledge. Um, and also this is important. And I think when I work with teachers, a lot of teachers have this approach to prevention of hate speech and prevention of other uh, negative phenomena that we have to protect the young people. We have to protect the young people against everything they meet in life, everything they meet online. Of course, this is impossible. Um, and as a teacher, you're not supposed to be everywhere uh, at all times. And this is an impossible task. This is not why you know you were hired and you're certainly not paid for it. Um, and another thing is, we cannot censor the internet, and it is not uh, from a democratic perspective, it's not an option, it's not desirable. So when we cannot protect the young people and we cannot cens uh, censor all the hate speech, all the bad things online, a lot of teachers ask me, well, then what can we do? Um, and I think that's where kind of um, the only thing we can do is empower students, uh, uh, give them the knowledge the skills, the attitudes, the confidence, uh, the competence to be active citizens online, meaning giving them the tools to, for instance, recognizing hate speech and also acting and taking an active stand against hate speech online as well as, well as offline. Um, and this is where I think schools have, have a role, uh, a very important role. Um, and this is also, I don't know how many of you have heard of the No Hate Speech Movement of the Council of Europe, which is kind of a background for what we do uh, at the European Bergland Center uh, and what we do in Poland, for instance, is the whole rationale behind the No Hate Speech Movement is exactly this, that we cannot protect, we can censor the internet, so we have to do something else. We have to build up um, a competence and knowledge and skills and attitudes, the right values among young people to themselves 
uh, take a stand for human rights and against hate speech. Um, so this is uh, so this is very briefly um, the role of of you know how the role of students in a sense how to empower students. And my next slide, I will talk a bit about uh, uh, the role of teachers. Um, and often, and I, I would say that just based on my experience um, in Norway and also in, in a lot of other um, European countries where we work, is that a lot of schools wait until the crisis uh, appears and then they have to do something, you know, and then they get, you know, almost frantic. They have to find a solution to the problem. Often, this solution will be short term because uh, they just want to be uh, they just want to get rid of the problem you know for instance we've had um we've had a case of uh, these gossip sites uh, appearing being uh, on online so students will create online sites where they um, bully each other where they share very bad pictures of fellow students and some of these um some of these posts are so bad that you know the police gets involved what happens is uh, the school head, the teacher reports it to the school head, the school head will uh, shut the site down and an investigation will start. The students behind the sites will maybe be, um, be recognized, uh, they will be punished, the students that have been bullied will be uh, uh, supported and will have, you know, uh, a feeling that they're they're hurt and then the school is done you know because they have found the solution but what often happens and we see this because it's a short term um it's a short term solution is that these sites these gossip sites reappear by other students or by other 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 schools they reappear and the same dynamics uh, continue um so we cannot wait for these crises to uh, to appear before we do something. And also when the crisis do appear, we have to use it as a starting point to work in a long-term perspective, to do something uh, to solve the problem long-term, to work about, to work with the underlying core, um, causes to these kind of problems. And I think, um, I think early prevention is of the utmost uh, important we have as early as we can with the students because we know that the value the attitudes of young people are are established very, very early on um and when we uh, when we work with teachers and kind of training them in in how to work in a classroom setting with this uh, our approach is a human rights education which uh, is an approach that is um based on teaching about through and for human rights. This means that it's not only about what you say, it's not only about what you say about uh, human, human rights, but it is about how you say it and how students um, experience human rights in a classroom setting. So if I'm a dictator in the classroom and nobody gets to speak, I'm the boss uh, and I teach about human rights, Obviously, the students will not really listen to what I say because they don't see it in practice. So we have to teach about, but also through human rights and for human rights. And what this means in relation to uh, prevention of hate speech um, is that as a teacher, you also have to have an open, um, an open approach when you, when you, when you. Uh, when you work with prevention of hate speech, meaning that you have to be open about the fact that you don't have all the answers, because often in these kind of issues, they're not clear cut answers. Uh, the world is very complex and often we have to discuss, we have to reflect, we have to kind of go back and forth before, before we find um, a solution that is the right solution for us, for our group, for our class. So you have to be honest about that you don't have all the all the all the answers, and your role is much more about facilitating, facilitating and creating this safe space that the classrooms need to be, um, for safe space for discussion, for reflection, for um, for challenging our, our views, etc. So it's and it's also I think the students will take you as a teacher more seriously when you say, 
okay, you guys, I don't actually know everything about Snapchat, about Facebook, about Twitter, but I know that you are good at this and maybe you can learn me and I can talk to you about what kind of values, what kind of attitudes we need to promote uh, both online and offline. So it's this open approach that is integral in, in human rights education. I also think an, uh, another important role of teachers, and we see, I hope you see when I talk about this, I hope you see that, um, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I hope you see when when I talk about this, I hope I, I forgot a bit what I was gonna say, but I remembered. I hope you see that it doesn't, when it, when when we boil it down, it doesn't really, it's not really about social media. It's not really about online. It's about what it, ha it has always been about, nah, namely, you know, educating democratic citizens, promoting um, uh, human rights, promoting values that schools have always promoted. But now we have this online uh, factor, which is only, which should be the same, you know, online is all, and offline should be the same. And we know, um, when we talk about, you know, why is hate speech so prevalent in, in, in Europe today? I showed you the figures earlier. Why is it so prevalent? I think there are, of, of course, a lot of, a lot of different um, causes to that. One is, you know, we see that economic crisis often or almost all the time leads to a human rights crisis as well. When there is a crisis of, you know, economic, social, political crisis in countries, it is very easy for ideologies, uh, hate ideologies, to gain more support because they find, you know, uh, uh, a cause to all our problems. Well, they will say the immigrants is why we have economic problem and build kind of an ideology, a political ideology based on that and get support. And we know this, and this is actually one of the reasons behind the no hate speech campaign of the Council of Europe is that we saw that in Europe, the economic crisis had led the extremist parties, extremist right wing parties and other parties in many European countries to get increased support. And through this increased support to right, right wing movements and parties, we saw kind of a normalization, a legitimization of hate, of uh, of hate speech in the political discourse. Because what happened when these parties gained more support, other parties would start adopting their um, their rhetorics. So we saw a normalization. So this is one part, you know, the how economic uh, crisis lead to human rights crisis. But what we also see, and I think this is important when we work with prevention of hate speech, especially with the online dimension, is Although uh, social media has been a natural part of our life for a long time, uh, we see that there's still an artificial divide between what we say online and what we say offline. What we allow ourselves to say online versus what we allow ourselves to say offline. And this is where schools have a role as well, where teachers have a role. We need to raise awareness around the fact that, you know, the online sphere is just as much part of uh, the public sphere as the offline sphere. And the rules of conduct should be the same in these two spheres. So, and in addition to this to uh, on the one hand, kind of underlying um, the importance of uh, kind of removing this artificial divide, it is also always, of course, important to point out that the specific, uh, the specific traits of the online world that makes hate speech um, potentially worse online because we know that online uh, the audience can be potentially um, uh, endless. You know, it can be uh, bullying in the schoolyard is limited. You know, the audience is limited by the physical space, by by the situation, but online the audience is potentially unlimited. So I think it's important to teach young people um, these two sides of the online world that on the one, one hand, normalizes make hate speech more normal. And on the other hand, it can also make it worse. So it's very important, this online dimension to 
um, use the classroom as a way of uh, of um, of raising awareness about that. Uh, another thing that we also, I'm sorry, I'm just going to drink this. Another thing that we also need to raise awareness about uh, is um, is where our language come from, where our prejudices come from, where where our stereotypes come from. Because I've seen in many schools that I work with, uh, students will use the worst language ever, really the worst language. And when you talk to them, they say, well, I was just joking. I didn't mean anything about it. I was just joking, you know, but and of course, I mean, I don't doubt their intentions, but it's important to raise awareness about where do our prejudice against Jewish people come from? Where do our uh, prejudice against black people come from? There is a history and we have seen what that history has done. You know, what those prejudices, what those kind of hate speech, what that kind of hate speech has done in history. You know, grotesque, really awful things has happened, have happened. So I think it is important, again, on the one hand, the point is not to label young people as racist, as uh, homophobic, as, sorry as anti-Semitic, that is not the point. But the point is to raise awareness about where do these, uh, uh, where do the language, the hateful language come from? And what has been the historic um, consequences of this language that is important. Um, and I also think, uh, and I will, uh, I will come to this in my next slide as well. I also think it's important to a lot of the values, and we can't really we can't really say that the the schools and the teachers are going to solve everything because, of course, that's not how the world works. And we know that a lot of the values, a lot of the attitudes that the students have, they get from the dinner table, they get at home. So you cannot really solve the issue completely without. And this is where the whole school approach also comes in. You can't really solve the whole issue without involving the parents, without involving the home. So I think as a, uh, the role of teachers and school heads, heads should also be to work with students, to work with parents, to create kind of a common co uh, code of conduct or common codes of conduct if you have uh, several for different things so that we have an agreement in the whole school community of how we talk to each other, what kind of um, what kind of attitudes and values do we share? And I will get a bit more into that in um, in the next slide, which is uh, how to ensure parents involvement. Uh, and this is, of course, not an easy task. And I know that a lot of schools do struggle with this element because a lot of parents will not be that much involved. And when they are involved in the school community, it's not necessarily a positive uh, involvement or contribution. Um, and like I said earlier, the aim of, uh, of um, involving parents is to ensure um, that the students hear the same at home as they hear at school, because because if you know at school you hear you know that you know uh, Islamophobia is a huge problem. You know we cannot say that all Muslims are terrorists. You know we cannot trust the media and and label all Muslims as terrorists because we see terrorist attacks in the media. If that's what they hear at school, but at the dinner table they hear the opposite. They hear that all Muslims are terrorists. All Muslims are bad. Obviously, the students will either be confused or will think that, you know, what I learned at school is not really true because my parents tell me otherwise. So it's extremely important in prevention of hate speech, in prevention of uh, discrimination. It is extremely important to that there is a consistency in what students are told at home and at school. And I think actually this is even more important the, uh, the younger these children are. Um, because we know that their influence of their parents is much stronger in the younger age and it kind of diminishes as the students grow older. Um, 
so and um, in order to reach this goal of you know a co common guidelines based on shared values between the home and the school i think we need to uh, adopt an approach of lifelong learning uh, as the basic principle for the home school relationship what this means is that as a teacher often you don't have only have to educate the students but in a sense you also have to educate the, their parents in you know or try at least to educate their parents um, and lifelong learning means you know what it says it means uh, that parents when they have children are not you know kind of not don't necessarily have the competence and the knowledge to to be to be a positive um, contributor to developing democratic citizens they also need education and help from the schools and other actors as well um, and based on the experience, uh, experience from other uh, from projects we have worked with what seems to work uh, are um, some of the things I'm going to say now is um, uh, one one way of kind of ensuring parents involvement ensuring the parents that parents show up when they are supposed to show up for parents conference meetings is to and and this is also good because it is a way of empowering the students as i said earlier it's very important to also empower the students is to for instance organize workshops where the students themselves can teach their parents for instance a crash course in social media and surely um, I would say a lot of students will be competent in doing this and it would be kind of a way to also showing there's the parents because a lot of parents I think are a bit anxious about social media they don't know what's going on so they think it's all bad so this is also a way of you know empowering the students in you know giving them a role as the teacher but also giving uh, the, the the parents kind of a bit of confidence that you know my my uh, my ch my child is very competent in he or she knows what he's do he or she is doing online and i now know more about social media so i am also less worried about social media uh, so that is uh, there's a lot of positive effect i think in this whole approach of letting the students take a lead and also we know that when parents know that their own child is going to be active in something and is going to be kind of on the stage, the likelihood of the parent showing up is also uh, bigger. So it has kind of a lot of uh, positive effects, I think. I also, I also believe in this um, having workshops for parents uh initiated in a sense by the needs of parents so to first ask the parents uh what do you want from us how can we contribute how can we what do you feel like you need in order to uh, better uh, the um, homeschool relationship and here there are and i know in poland as well there are many ngos who also work with non-formal education who who can be brought in as a way of um making it exciting and uh, interesting for the parents and i also have um, have heard many times that a way of also getting parents to because uh, some parents will be hesitant to talk about some issues because maybe they know that they themselves have some attitudes some values that are not shared by the others and um, so they're a bit reluctant to show up for meetings that discuss you know now we're going to discuss discrimination now we're going to discuss hate speech or things like that they will probably those kind of parents will probably not show up so what is advice is actually to have workshops or to use activities such as um uh, such as arts and crafts uh, uh, workshops or food you know food making classes or food sharing food um uh, preparation classes or you know have activities where the parents are involved in an activity so they're using their hands and while they're using their hands you can also initiate discussions about these things that you really want to discuss so it's like um and we have seen that this this works with a lot of a lot of parents because they're there to do something that's fun and uh, useful for themselves and at the same time um uh they they kind of 
you also open up to discussion to um, sharing experiences. Um, we also know um, that peer to peer learning works with parents. So to kind of uh, identify which parents in the group can be of use uh, in a workshop setting or in a meeting setting and can be kind of a, a team player with you as a teacher and so that the that the parents learn from other parents and there's because they have something in common they have the the children in common that are friends or are uh, classmates so this is also a way of ensuring i think parents involvement so i have been talking uh, for a long time and i'm sorry if i talk too fast uh i i have heard that i do sometimes but i just wanted to to get everything across to you. And um, I want to lastly, and this is my one of my last slides, I want to talk about a bit, a bit about uh, how practice because obviously you can say a lot of things, you know, um, in that work in theory, but in practice won't work. Um, I have tried to build my whole kind of webinar today on um, ex uh, what I have experienced to work in practice from the field. Uh, but I will also highlight kind of three things that I have seen, uh, kind of a lot of places that I have seen work. Um, and that I that you can in a sense say are success criteria. They are criteria for uh, kind of having success in, in prevention in general and uh, prevention of hate speech uh, more specifically. One thing is, and I think as a teacher, you're, you're, you can have a role in this as well, is commitment from leadership. All over, you know, across countries, across schools, across regions, we have seen that when the school head is involved, when the school head thinks this is important, change happens. Because after all, the school heads do dictate a lot of what is the school uh, priorities. And as a teacher, of course, you can work to get the school head uh, and to commit and to see this as something important. And I hope that some of the things that I, I have shown you today and I have discussed with you today um, uh, is of help for that. And uh, one, of, one of the examples for this is really, we are working with a school in them. Oslo is a very divided city. You have um, the East and the West. The West is more affluent, uh, more white, uh, higher class in a sense, although we don't use the class term as much as in Norway. Um, while the East is more, um, how to say, it's more diverse, it's socioeconomically, uh, lower uh, background. Uh, and we also know that between the East and the West in Oslo, there is a 10 years difference of life ex expectancy higher in the East than in the, um, no, in the West than in the East. So Lindeberg uh, Lower Secondary School is a school in the East. Um, and I have visited and I work with this school uh, quite a lot. It's a school where there's all sorts of ethnicities. I think, you know, about 150 different um, ethnic groups were presented. So you have a huge amount of diversity. At that school, there was a vice, he was not the headmaster, but he was the vice principal. This vice principal saw that there were some challenges in school and took it upon himself to, to do something about it. So he contacted us and he said, how do I do this? And we talked to him uh, about the whole school approach and how he should uh, proceed to um, to work with prevention of hate speech. And he got the student council involved, the parents involved, the teachers involved, and the rest of the school community involved. The school had the other school has involved, and they are working now in a long term. Uh, perspective, of course, because I think this is important to work systematically and long term with these challenges to create uh, common guidelines for the school, to create uh, strategies for what, what the school should do to deal with um, bullying when it occurs. And, the, and he himself, and I can say this for a lot of the schools, it's one person, that's all it takes, can change the whole school ethos, the whole school 
culture in a sense. So the school heads is very important uh, without doubt. I also, another thing that I have seen, um, that I have seen really work in a lot of places is student-led initiatives. When the students take control themselves because they are given they are given a role in taking control, amazing things really happen. We have one one school, uh, Rundi Lower Secondary School, which we have worked uh, worked with, um, which is a bit outside of Oslo, and. They have really put the students in in the center of their efforts to uh, prevent discrimination and hate speech. And what we see there is the students themselves um, take control and they uh, start initiatives. For instance, they have uh, this one a project where, uh, with a peer-to-peer -peer learning, in a sense, where the higher grade students, the older students, teach the younger students. And we know that this is very effectful because we know that in the school, in the schoolyard, younger students look up to um, the older teachers. So this is very effective. So if the older teachers are good examples, uh, they they promote you know good values. They are against bullying. They are against hate speech. The chances of the uh, younger students of having the same attitudes will increase. So this is very effectful. Give the students, and also because it's about popularity, it's about you know all these mechanisms in the schoolyards, use these mechanisms for something positive. So the, we have seen that this work in a lot of instances. Um, another another thing, and I and I have uh, and I have mentioned this earlier as well, is to have a long term perspective. Short term, and I really cannot emphasize this enough. I cannot uh, underline this enough. Enough short term solutions are really just short term solutions. And we need to uh, look in a long term perspective and we need to focus on building a democratic school cu culture. Um, and it takes time. It's not a quick fix. It's not, uh, it's not something that happens overnight. It takes time. We see this, we have something called, or it is finishing now, but it, it has been a three year program here in Norway. Um, called DEMBRA or Democratic Preparedness Against Racism and Antisemitism. What this is, it's a long term uh, program where the schools are committed for one and a half years um, to work consistently uh, with us and with our partners in, in building a democratic school culture. What we see with these schools who have, you know, worked long term is after three years, the schools are still working. They still have projects. They still have initiatives because they have um, they have recognized this as something important, and they carry on the work themselves long after the the project is gone. So I think this is important as well. Always have the whole school approach. Always have the long term perspective. Um, I think actually that was all I had for this webinar. I hope that you have found it useful. Thank you all for your attention. Um, and please, if you have any questions, you can write them down or you can ask me now. Uh, but that was all for me. Thank you. Well, uh, well uh, thank you, Zakia. Thank you, Zakia. Uh, if uh, any of the participants have uh, any questions, uh, I invite you to write them down. Uh, in the chat window. chat window. Thank you, Kate, and thank you, Gatha, for for participating. Uh, I hope you found it useful. Thank you, Dominic. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dominic. That's very nice. <laughs> very nice. Uh, so I think that uh, if, uh, if you have a question but don't know how to uh, uh, express it, I think you can just send it to uh, Marina Janusz and we will send it over to Zakia. Yes. So you... Okay, so it seems that no one has any questions. 
so uh, thank you for this lecture. It was very interesting. Very interesting. Thank you. And uh, thank you for uh, participation. Thank you, Marlena. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Uh, this was to me. It was my first webinar, and it was very exciting. So I hope to do this again. Uh, I hope so too. <laughs> so, <laughs> Good feeling. Okay. Okay. Great. So I great. think we can close this meeting now. Okay. okay. Great. Thank you so much. So, Bye, everybody. Have a nice day. Bye, Melina. Bye, everybody. Bye, Philippe. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.